Mrs Griffiths had come into the bedroom with a glass of milk. She gave the drink to Erlis and then walked over to the window. It's snowing again, she said. What a start to the winter. Oh, I love the snow, said Erlis. I know, Mrs Griffiths smiled. And then something through the window caught her eye. Someone's out there, she said, lying on the ground in the snow. Is it Gwyn? She opened the window to call her son, but suddenly a shaft of light pierced the snow and with a deafening crack hit the ground just where Gwyn lay. Mrs Griffiths screamed and fell to the floor. Erlis, who had run to her, was the only one to see what happened within the circle of thorn trees. She saw the ground sparkle and shake and Gwyn's arms outstretched, tossing like a bird in the wind. She saw his hands glowing in the snow and the earth beneath them crack and a shower of glittering icicles fly up and festoon the trees like tinsel. And in one of the trees, something shone brighter than a star and she knew that Ariane Wen was safe. Only then did Erlis run to fetch a cold flannel. She laid it on Mrs Griffith's head and gently stroked her hair. Mrs Griffiths opened her eyes. It's you, she said, and she took the girl's hand. What happened? I feel queer and so afraid. It's the snow, Erlis replied. It's the whiteness. It makes you feel queer sometimes. Mrs Griffiths sat up still keeping the girl's hand clasped in hers. It's so good to have you here, she said. They stayed quiet and quite still for a moment, the girl kneeling beside the woman, calm and silent, until Mrs Griffiths suddenly got to her feet, explaining, What a nurse I am. It's you who's supposed to be the patient. Back to bed now, or the doctor will be telling me off. She had just tucked the girl's blanket in again when Gwyn appeared in the doorway. He was wet with snow and smiling triumphantly. Gwyn, was that you out there lying in the snow? Are you mad? No, not mad. A magician, he replied. Mrs Griffiths made a click noise with her tongue. I don't know, she said. Sometimes I wonder if Mrs Davis was right about you. Can I talk to Erlis for a bit? You ought to be in school, his mother said. But seeing as you aren't, yes, you can have a chat. <clears throat> Change your clothes first, mind, and dry your hair. <coughs> Gwyn retreated. When he returned, dry to the bedroom, he was carrying his grandmother's black book. I got Ariane when, he said, and he held out his hand and allowing the silver spider to crawl out onto the patchwork quilt. I had to fight for her. Something was trying to stop me. I saw, said Erlis. You are a magician, Gwyn. Gwyn was gratified, yet a little embarrassed. I've been looking at Nine's book, he told the girl. I can read it. I never thought I could. Read it to me then, and I will try and find the demon in the broken horse. Gwyn sat on the bed and began to read the old Welsh legends, translating as he went. It was not an easy ta task, but more he read, the more fluent he became, and Avis heard again the story that she half remembered from the time when Nine had sat where Gwyn was sitting now, and would talk on and on until she slept. She heard about kings and princes, magicians and giants, even the knights of the Knights of King Arthur, but nowhere could Gwyn find a broken horse. Read about Princess Branwen, Erlis said. There are horses in that legend, I remember. They used to make me cry, but I've forgotten it. Gwyn began the story of Branwen. Before he had read two pages in, he suddenly stopped and said quietly, I found it. But it's too terrible to read out loud. I can't read it. Tell me, said Erlis. I can't. Gwyn stared at the page and there were tears in his eyes. Tell me, she insisted. You'll hate it, said Gwyn. And then he read. Evnesen, 
Branwen's brother came upon the King of Ireland's horse. Whose horses are these? he asked. They belong to the King of Ireland, said the soldiers. He has come to marry your sister, Branwen. And Efnisen screamed. No one asked me. No one asked my consent. She shall not marry the King of Ireland. And he drew his sword and filled with rage and hatred, cut off the horse's ears and their tails, their eyelids and their lips, until they screamed with pain and no one could touch them. Silence filled the room and Gwyn said, You're sorry now I told you. No, there is a drawn the quilt around her neck. We had to know. Perhaps the mad prince never died, but came back locked in the broken horse because of what he'd done. Nine tried to burn the horse, but she couldn't, said Gwyn. It couldn't be destroyed, so it was given to the magician to keep safe, it was suggested. They were the most powerful men in the land in those days, she, she paused and then said, Well, you know what you have to catch. I know his name, but I can't see him. How do I know where he is? He's on the mountain for sure. You'll be able to feel him, and you have Arianwen to help you. Gwyn went to the window and drew the curtains wide. It was light now, and the snowflakes were flying past the, the window. Some would linger in the journey and dance gently up and down against the pane before drifting onto the apple tree. Perhaps you should be you'd better wait, said Ailis, when she saw the snow. There'll be a blizzard on the mountain. No, I daren't wait. Something will happen if I don't stop him now. I won't go far. I know what to do. Tell Mam I've gone to see Nine. 